Hudson Only mode. Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network, the EBM Tools Network. And um, today we also have Nick Weiner on from Open Channels uh, co-hosting this webinar. Um, the network is co-coordinated by NatureServe and Open Channels. Um, so we, and we also have on Kelly Wachowitz from Catch Invest who's going to be speaking to us uh, today about impact investing to fund marine conservation. We're very excited to have Kelly on and I got a preview of the webinar yesterday and it's going to be really interesting. Um, and before we get started, before I turn this over to Kelly, I just wanted to let people know how to ask questions. Uh, we'll have a presentation for about 30 to 40 minutes and then we'll use the remaining time for questions. You can uh, type the questions into the question panel, the user interface, and I can relay them to Kelly. Uh, if you have a working microphone or if you've entered the PIN, um, if you're using the phone, you can also raise your virtual hand. There's a little hand icon in the user interface. You can raise your virtual hand and I'll unmute you for you to ask the question. Um, but that option only works, again, if you have a working microphone or if you've entered the PIN number. But um, you can enter the question into the, you can type the question into the question panel at any point. Um, I will ask uh, I, I, if there's any cl quick clarifying questions, I may ask Kelly during uh, her presentation, but uh, substantive questions will hold for the end for the Q&A, but you can send them in, those questions in at any point. Okay, anyway, welcome Kelly, and I'll turn it over to you now. Great. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me. I'm really excited to have the chance to speak to you all virtually. It's just the coolest thing that we can be building a community of practice from all corners of the world um, through this kind of tool and technology. So um, it's really exciting to be here with you all. And hopefully you'll find this presentation useful. And if not, I, I invite you even here at the outset to reach out, um, you know, after the webinar is over, my email address and is uh, at the back of the presentation. And I'd be happy to engage with others to, to dig in a little bit deeper in some of these case studies that we're going to share with you today or on other topics of interest. So just quickly, by way of introduction, I wanted to tell you a little bit about my background and how I came to this work. Um, I started out my, um, I have a degree in history, um, but I, I spent the bulk of my career working in finance and investing, initially for one of the big bad investment banks and then ultimately for smaller um, specialty firms focused on real estate investing and forestry investing. And in, uh, I guess it's now been almost exactly 10 years ago when I first started working around forest investments, um, I knew that I wanted to transition to do something that was more purpose driven. And so about five years ago, um, I began to work on fisheries investing. I saw there, there being a lot of parallels between the world of forestry and, and sustainable forest management and what might be done uh, to support sustainable fisheries management. So um, most recently, I, was, I had the, the great opportunity to lead the development of six investment blueprints or investment cases uh, with funding from Bluebird Philanthropies and worked as a partner at Encourage Capital, um, which you'll see mentioned a few places in the presentation. And, um, and then about a year ago, I teamed up with a really great partner, Paul Parker, to launch Catch Invest, which is being formed as a way to invest in um, sustainable fisheries in partnership with fishermen and, and fishing community organizations. So that's my quick background. And I thought it might be helpful for folks listening in to just spend a few minutes talking about what is an impact investment. Um, if you look at the Wikipedia definition, our new go-to source of information, you can see that impact investing refers to an investment that's made into a company, a project, an organization, or a fund that has the intention of generating a specific uh, social or environmental impact alongside of a financial return. So unlike a grant, um, which you see kind of listed here at the top of this table, where uh, you know, a funder is willing to give money to someone else with no expectation of return of that capital, no expectation of any profits on that capital, um, an impact investment involves a funder who wants to have some return of their capital and profit on their capital generated 
but also is really specifically investing to support social and environmental outcomes. It's a very exciting new field of investing, and there are, um, I'll, I'll speak to a minute, or in a minute, about the depth of funding that could end up being directed to this, um, to this new area of focus, and, you know, it's sort of part of the longer evolution of socially responsible investing. The table that I've got on this second slide here to the right, uh, sorry, on this slide, shows you the range of different kinds of impact investments that uh, might be deployed and describes what the return requirements might be for the different kinds of investments. So as we just mentioned, a grant by definition has no expectation of return. That's just a funder trying to support a program or a project. Um, in the U.S. in particular, there's a type of loan investment called a Program Related Investment, or PRI, um, and those are typically foundations or um, philanthropic families that are trying to lend money to support investments, but typically with a very low um, interest rate requirement. So maybe just a 1% interest rate or uh, up to 3% interest rate. Um, those are payments that it would be made on a fixed annual schedule over time. And those kind of lenders would expect 100% return, if you look to the far right column, of the capital that they initially lend out. The next kind of funder might be a traditional lender or loan, where um, there might be a wider range or higher range of return required. I've listed here 4 to 8 percent, also payments on a fixed schedule, and also requiring 100 percent return of that capital. An um, impact equity requirement to be differentiated from the next one there on the list, the market rate equity, or sorry, investment, <clears throat> is a type of investment where it's an investor that's willing to take higher risk, is willing to accept variable annual payments, so they might not know exactly what their, you know, dividend could be or, or interest uh, earned on that investment in any given year. Um, and because there's variability associated with the payment stream that they would receive, typically they require a higher rate of return. The market rate equity investor is always looking for a return that's higher than a loan funder would earn. And here I've shown a range of 8 to 25 percent. I mean, that can go actually much higher if you're a venture capital investor. Um, and an impact equity investor I sort of listed as what some people sometimes call a concessionary investor um, that's willing to take some discount to what otherwise would be a financial return connected to the level of risk and variability in the investment. Um, so those are kind of two kinds of equity investors that might participate. Both expect, you know, full return of their capital. And, uh, and finally, there's another kind of, of impact investment that people sometimes utilize, which we could loosely call credit enha enhancement. And those are our funders that try to support other investors and reduce the risk in a given investment. For example, a social impact bond um, in New York City that was launched some years ago that ended up hitting some trouble had a loan guarantee from uh, the Bloomberg Foundation. And, um, and that allowed the actual investors who put up all the money to know that if there was if the investment were to hit any trouble spots, that Bloomberg would help make them whole on the amount of money they had invested. And those credit enhancement providers sometimes charge fees um, for, you know, depending on the level of guarantee or support that they're providing to a, a given strategy. So there's really a wide range of capital sources that can be put to work to try to support these social and environmental strategies, um, in particular fisheries, as we'll talk about in a moment. Now, for people who are in the NGO community or um, have been working with community organizations, I often get asked the question, why would I want to take an equity investment where I have to pay back these, you know, this capital and these returns if I could get a grant? And I always tell people, if you can get the free money, you should take it. <laughs> the problem is there's really not enough philanthropic capital to support the scale of effort we need to undertake to repair some of these um, 
to address some of the environmental and social challenges that we face to restore ecosystems to manage our assets sustainably. And so if we don't have enough grant money to fix our problems, where else can we look um, for support? That's really the first reason that impact investments um, can add something and contribute something to the equation here is that it brings new capital to solve problems that we face. It can also allow in any given instance the ability to fund things at a larger scale. For those of you that um, are active in the grant writing or, or fundraising space, you know that it's difficult to, to sometimes generate more than uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars or maybe a few million dollars in grants to support your work. Um, and by bringing this kind of capital to the table, there's the opportunity to undertake much larger projects, uh, more complex projects, projects that um, have long time horizons and many stakeholders. So that's, that's a second important benefit that this kind of funding source can provide. Uh, those are really the kind of quantitative benefits that impact capital can bring. But there are two other important, I think, um, really conceptual ideas to talk about here. Um, when it's been our experience so far that when you can bring a source of capital to the table, that that capital can often catalyze the political and stakeholder momentum required to build out a project. So, um, you know, working with fishing organizations and being able to say, we have an investor that's willing to support you, um, that can really mobilize action in a sense of urgency that might not otherwise exist. And that can be very helpful in terms of enlisting the stakeholder support that you need to really move forward. So that's a really important element to consider. And then finally, um, the practice of investing in the traditional markets has really evolved to be a very disciplined and robust and methodical um, uh, approach that, that can really create a lot of discipline in project design. And by that I mean, um, to, to share an example from the world of fisheries, you may, you may have experienced situations where, um, for example, someone's working on a fishery improvement plan or a FIP, and um, I, I've often noticed that for lack of funding, those FIPs might, might only really describe interventions that need to be taken in the first year or two of a project, and that is, uh, can be a great approach in terms of thinking about incremental progress. And I think putting an NGO hat or nonprofit organization's hat on, one can be very excited about incremental progress. Incremental progress is better than no progress. And you know, you might not know what the outcome's going to be, but you know that getting to point B is better than being stuck at point A. On the other hand, an investor really has to be sure and have visibility through to the final outcomes of a project in order to be assured that they can achieve a financial return. And so from an investor's point of view, incremental progress doesn't provide enough assurance. They want to see a comprehensive approach through the timeline to success. And in doing so, that can really add a certain discipline to the project design because it forces um, the project designers to put more effort into the budgeting that might be required or the est estimating what it might take to get stakeholder engagement over a period of time. And going back to the fifth example, it might mean um, developing a fisheries improvement plan that has a five or seven year timeline and does a decent job of estimating what the costs of all those management improvements might be in a given fishery. And so um, that, that can just be a very helpful uh, approach in terms of developing projects that have, by virtue of in kind of investing a little bit more up front in designing those strategies, might have a higher likelihood of long-term success. So those are four important reasons to look at impact capital as a source of support for fisheries improvement projects. There, we also know, as I sort of alluded to earlier, that there really is a growing, a strong and growing interest among investors to support this kind of work. Um, some $45 trillion of assets globally that are now aligned with principles for responsible investing. Um, Encourage Capital did a study a few years ago that showed that the de development finance institutions, those are the, 
the big uh, multilateral or bilateral development banks, DFID and and the GZID and um, even USAID in this category might fit. They have deployed some tw over twenty billion dollars to support uh, various kinds of impact investments, and surveys suggest that they expect to increase that level by fifty percent over the. Um, the next five years from the time that this study was done in 2013. And private investors, meaning families, uh, foundations, you know, non-governmental organizations um, with capital have in turn invested almost $2 billion over the five years prior to this study and, uh, and indicated that they were looking to increase their level of investment by some 200%. So there's really a great opportunity to align these investors with more responsible um, and sustainable strategies. Uh, those on the phone may have seen some of the organizations or interacted with some of the organizations represented here. I wanted to just describe to you a range of the investment managers that are focused in particular on wild catch fisheries. There are others that are focused on aquaculture. <coughs> but kind of from left to right on this screen, you can see uh, on a bit of a timeline how some of these organizations have developed. On the far left, I would highlight the BBEDC, the Bristol Bay Economic Development Corporation. Uh, it's an or, it's a, essentially a native and community organization in the state of Alaska that was given an allocated free fishing quota when the Alaskan fisheries transitioned to quota management systems some 30 years ago. And the BBEDC now has a balance sheet based on its kind of reinvestment of profits over time of some over $200 million. It's tremendously successful in terms of providing a range of programming to support community outcomes and livelihoods of local community members that otherwise would have lost fishing access and probably um, uh, when we find when communities lose access, it can lead to all kinds of destructive behavior and illegal fishing activities. So, uh, although the BBEDC doesn't have a specific conservation focus, it does uh, do a great job of supporting community members on the social side of the equation. And the other uh, sort of three or four organizations you see underneath the BBEDC have evolved more recently over the last 10 years, the Cape Cod Fishermen's Trust, the Dutchy Fish Quota Company out of the UK, the Monterey Bay Fisheries Trust in California, and, and the Mora Bay Community Quota Fund are all organizations that have been working with fishermen, investing in fishing quota and quota systems, and then using the profits generated from that to support ongoing management improvements in their fisheries. Those strategies, uh, as I'll touch on a little, a little bit later, are operating in fisheries that are, generally speaking, well managed. Um, they, you know, they all have their challenges, but in uh, in large part are sort of uh, strong, have strong regulatory systems already in place. And then um, on the right side of the slide, you see a collection of other organizations that you may have seen some press around or heard, heard about or worked with um, that are trying to sort of push the limit around the level of risk that they're willing to undertake with investing strategies and the, um, the degree of difficulty and complexity in order to try to bring this capital to work in fisheries that are in a um, more difficult situation with less, with a weaker regulatory framework, with um, that are in a more severe state of depletion, et cetera. And there I would highlight uh, certainly our own organization, Catch Invest, which is focused initially on some quota investing strategies, but will also be exploring opportunities to support fishery transitions um, and implement significant accountability um, programs, et cetera. The Althelia Ecosphere Sustainable Ocean Fund, based out of the UK, which is undertaking a strategy to make a wide range of investments in marine conservation, including sustainable fisheries, but also other um, so-called so blue economy activities. The Rare Malloy Fund, which I'm pleased to report, um, made its first investment of around a million dollars in a company in the Philippines uh, called Meliamar. Meliamar is a, is a small fish processing company that sources only from fishermen utilizing sustainable fishing practices in the Philippines. And the, 
that particular investment was one of the ones profiled in the investment blueprints that the Bloomberg Philanthropies and Rockefeller Foundation supported and that I worked on um, over the last couple of years. I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But uh, RARE receives its, its funding from a philanthropist in New England, the Grantham Foundation, and the Global Environment uh, Fund and is looking to do additional investments in Southeast Asia more along the lines of, lo of loans uh, than equity. So if you think back to that first slide I showed you, uh, but really represent a, a great foot forward in terms of um, new investment strategies that are willing to take more risk um, in fisheries that are very challenged. Obviously the Philippines um, you know, has a big overfishing problem, especially in the inshore areas. And um, it's very exciting that they're making this first step. And then Encourage Capital, my former um, home and employer, just uh, this past week announced the launch of Pescador Holdings, which is being funded by the Walton Family Foundation, um, and made their first investment in a Chilean uh, seafood processing company called Heomar. I believe it was about a $3 million investment, and that strategy is focused on implementing sustainable fishing practices from all of the communities that supply the company and in acquiring other companies that can do the same thing in other parts of the world. Um, they just announced, made that announcement last week and then it's exciting to think about where they might be able to take that um, with some of the funding support that they have. But it does sort of point to the, the fact that Although these sort of less risky investments into well-managed fisheries on the quota side are, have been evolving and developing and expanding their reach for the last 10 years, these kind of more risky investments on the fishery transition side are really just uh, now emerging and, and um, there's great promise for the, the use of impact investment to support these fishery transitions, but we're really at the early stage of trying to figure out how to do that. So I thought it would be helpful for all the practitioners on the phone to try to talk about what does it take to build an investment, to create an investment case or a business case. Um, what is the investment strategy and plan, including all the costs, revenues, and process, uh, profits for the duration of the investment? And I've, I've really outlined here five key building blocks or considerations, and we can go through them. The first one, you know, and maybe this would be the most obvious thing, is to have a robust fishery and community impact strategy. For those of you that have worked with academic institutions or for nonprofit or non-governmental organizations, you, you're very familiar with this approach. You're trying to figure out what are the management improvements that need to be made to repair a fishery, what action needs to be taken by the government, what do we need the fishermen or community or fleet to be doing? Is there a reduction of effort required? Does there need to be greater monitoring um, and observer coverage on vessels that are in the water? Does there need to be a reduction of fishing effort altogether? Do there need to be a reduction of vessels in the fishery? So the fishery and community impact strategy is obviously a cornerstone to an impact investment approach and needs to be well thought out. Um, the second thing, and this sort of what differentiates a, a grant-funded project from an impact investment, is to have what I've called here a commercial strategy. Some people call this the business case, or um, you know, what what is your cash flow strategy? And here we're trying to ask the question: What asset or business can we invest in that generates profits? If you're talking about a funding source that needs to get a repayment of their principal and some profit on top of that, then what kind of asset or business can you invest in that will generate those profits that's connected to the impact strategy? Examples of those kinds of investments uh, might be fishing quota, as we've talked about before, and attaching bells and whistles and requirements to how that quota is used. Um, might include investing in supply chain businesses where if the supply chain business profits as a fishery recovers, there's a strong alignment of interest there. Um, there could be more of a public-private partnership approach where an investor could cut a deal with the government to take a share of tax revenue collection at the dock uh, for, fish, um, uh, for fish that are landed in a kind of newly managed system. 
and uh, or there might be other mechanisms to take a share of landings revenue. So there, uh, an investment case needs to have some strategy by which it has a security interest, some kind of secured interest in receiving a, a stream of payments or cash flows to repay its, its principal, its initial investment, and generate some kind of profit. Um, the really important thing here to mention is that in terms of the commercial asset or business to invest in, there really needs to be an alignment of the investment with the long-term fishery health or improvement. And that's why quota can be such a powerful tool and way to invest in a fishery because if a fishery is depleted, the quota might not be worth very much. Um, I'll share in a case study in a moment um, an instance where uh, because the fishery is depleted, you know, the quota value is not very high, but as the fishery strengthens, the quota value increases. And, um, you know, that sort of cat share alignment that EDF and others have um, been proponents of really does um, does make a lot of sense from an alignment of interest standpoint. But quota is not the only way to do that. There could be other um, ways to align uh, the business interest with long-term fishery health or improvement. And what one needs to be careful to avoid is to invest, uh, make an investment into a business that um, runs the risk of over exploiting the fishery in the short term at the cost of the long term health. So supply chain investments have that risk attached to them because their profit potential um, can be maximized in some earlier period, but if it's not paired with the right management interventions on the water, um, can actually be a detriment to the fishery because it actually just increases the value that fishermen can generate for illegal activity um, and so forth. So that when you kind of move into a supply chain or other investment of that nature, then there need to be more bells and whistles to try to make sure that the alignment still exists. The third building block to take into consideration is the structure of the investment. And there are different kinds of structural elements to consider. Uh, for one, who are the owners of the given asset or business? Um, what are, what is the governance mechanism and the decision-making control around the fisheries management improvements and the timing of, of release of different funds to support different elements of a project? Um, what are the stakeholder roles and responsibilities and is there accountability for fulfillment of those roles? Are there liabilities or penalties for failure to fulfill them? What is the legal structure which relates very much to what the local jurisdictional requirements are going to be country by country. This, this can vary um, somewhat in terms of what entities are allowed to hold different kinds of assets and businesses. And in the case of impact investments, there's a particular challenge, depending on the jurisdiction, with combining grant capital with, uh, let's say, return-seeking capital more generally. So grant funders, um, in the United States, uh, the case I know best of all, are not really allowed to use their philanthropic funding to generate a profit return for someone else. Um, you know, the grant funders, foundations, and other philanthropists uh, are able to manage those grant funds on a tax-free basis, and so they're not allowed to use them to then in turn generate profits um, for others in a direct way. There has to be a public benefit, a clear public benefit that's generated from the use of the grant funds. And so creating a legal structure that allows a combination, in some cases these investments require a combination of grant funding and return seeking capital, it's important to try to get the legal structure right and that can be challenging. And then finally the capital structure, sort of speaking to the different layers of uh, funding sources that you might have in a given project um, where you're combining multiple sources alone and some equity or a grant alone and some equity. So um, getting the structure right is a really important element of the process. Um, next, the fourth building block, creating a robust financial model. <coughs> and the financial model needs to take into consideration what the upfront expenditures are for a given strategy, the ongoing expenses of a given strategy, the revenues and the revenue capture mechanism as we touched on before, and the profits, so sort of the net benefit. Um, in, academic uh, jargon, we might call this a cost-benefits analysis, but as an investor, we think of this as a 
a returns analysis, a cash flow analysis. And a financial model for investors, um, you know, in the mainstream markets, most investment vehicles or strategies in these kinds of a liquid um, investments or investments that, you know, you can't trade on a public stock market, let's say, they uh, traditionally have had a, a pretty short time frame relative to the context of a fisheries improvement strategy. So somewhere in the range of five years. In, in the mainstream uh, capital markets, it has been the case that forestry investments have enticed investors to support longer time horizons. So in other words, they they commit their money and their money's locked up and there's not really a promise of returning that capital to them for a 10, sometimes a 15 year time horizon. So that gives us a signal as to what might be possible in the world of fisheries. We know that um, a lot of fisheries strategies need time for biomass to recover and for management improvements to take hold or even to be undertaken. And, um, and so our hope is that we can really um, attract investors that are willing to support sort of a five to ten year time horizon but uh, probably need to be reassured they can get their capital back within that ten year time horizon so that can be a constraining factor for some fisheries that might have a longer time horizon to really reach its its um, optimal efficiency and, and level of productivity under sustainable management the financial model also needs to consider not only a base case projection of these cash flows um, over that time horizon, but also a best case scenario and a worst case scenario. And depending on the level of sophistication, the financial model might have, you know, 10 scenarios that it models um, or tries to stress test the cash flows against a number of, of variable assumptions. So if your financial model is dependent on the price of fish at the dock, you know, we know that that, that price is going to vary over time and in your financial model you're, you'll have to be stress testing what happens if there's an extended period where the price is at the low end of the range that it has had historically. Um, but conversely, it's also important to look at the best case scenario and when an investor tries to consider what return they require for a given investment, they are often weighing what is the probability that I hit the low end of the range versus the probability that I hit the high end of the range. And the more variability there is, then the higher they want the upside case to be. And the less variability there is, then the, the less difference they want there to be between the worst case and the base case um, return projection. So it's, <clears throat> it's a complicated analysis, and you'll, you'll see at the end of my presentation, I for those that aren't, um, uh, haven't developed a professional expertise in developing these kind of financial models, this is a way in which it might be useful to seek out help to, to understand how to consider all of the financial variables in determining what the return might be for an investor and making that business case to a set of investors. So um, we touched a, a little bit on risk. I wanted to highlight here that <coughs> the higher the risk, the higher the financial and impact return requirements should be conceptually. Um, you see the four building blocks we've touched on already, the fishery and community impact strategy, the commercial strategy, the structure and the financial model. We really, as an investor, look at all those things and then sort of weigh them against the risk or probability of success. And in order to analyze the risk, investors look at the historical performance of some of the drivers in the equation. So that speaks to what is the price volatility and so forth. They're going to look at the biological risk of if it's a depleted fishery, what's the, what's the real chance it can recover? What are the drivers around that biological risk? And, and can we overcome them with our management interventions? Um, what's the level of regulatory risk? And, you know, much of the, res much of the publications They've talked about impact investing address this risk um, very directly for fisheries that have a uh, very limited regulatory framework. There's just by definition a high degree of regulatory risk for fisheries that have a strong regulatory framework already in place. That risk hopefully will be lower. So that's a very important consideration. How can that derail the performance of this strategy? The management risk. 
what what who are the team members what's their level of expertise what's their track record in the space do they kind of know to already know how to do what they're trying to do um, and do, you know does the team that's trying to put this together have the ability to to execute on the strategy what's the transaction structure mitigation of risk so a lot of the structuring topics are around trying to reduce risk in a particular um, strategy you might you know have a capital structure and you say wow you know there's a lot of volatility in these cash flows I think I'll I'll layer in a credit enhancement to help reduce the risk for the primary investor so that structure can help to reduce risk um, and then again looking at these best and worst case scenarios and based on the level of risk in the investment in you know, all of those first four elements that really drives what an investor's return expectations are both on the impact and the financial side and what kind of impact returns are probably appropriate in, in looking at sustainable fisheries investments? I've highlighted the four that uh, I think are most directly connected. There could be others. But protecting and restoring fish stocks, supporting fisher livelihoods as act, you know, you, who you need to remain as responsible actors in a fishery um, and support its management. Feeding more people uh, in the case of fisheries that have the opportunity to be restored. And then uh, financial returns that could range anywhere from 5% to 25% or higher. And um, of course, there are you know, many ways to measure each of these different uh, returns. <clears throat> the um, protecting and restoring fish stocks, even by itself, for some people, may not be a sufficient measure because you may be focused on what is the degree of ecosystem health. And that you know, goes beyond the the potential um, or the measures of biomass of a specific stock. You know, you're, you may be wanting to measure the degree of biodiversity protection. <clears throat> Some of those, um, those broader metrics that are very important from a conservation standpoint, I would say, however, are very hard to measure from an investor standpoint because it's, it's not so clear. It's very hard scientifically to show the direct correlation between management interventions and some of these other measures. So, um, if you're, if, if an investor, if you're kind of promising an investor an impact return that's tied to biodiversity improvement um, and you don't have a way of knowing with great certainty that your investment can affect that biodiversity, um, you know, maybe that's not something that you want to promise to an investor. It doesn't mean that it wouldn't be a part, an important part of your management improvements and, and overall project strategy. Um, but it might not be something that you, you want to promise to investors. Uh, as, as you all probably know, it's hard enough to, to try to assure investors that this impact is going to protect and restore fish stocks, which by themselves have such a high degree of variability given the changing ecosystem conditions and issues around climate change and so forth. Um, supporting fisher livelihoods, ways to measure that might include looking at average fisher incomes, looking at um, uh, fisher net worth, looking at the volatility of fisher incomes, uh, might be looking at com aggregate community wealth. And these are hard things to measure. They can be expensive to measure, you know, typically, uh, or, or where we've tried to develop these strategies that might require doing household surveys, for example. And in terms of looking at the socioeconomic impacts on a community with a fishing strategy, it might be helpful to find a good partner that already knows how to do that. Most people working on fisheries management improvements aren't at the same time experts in you know, measuring community wellness and community economic development. But there are, we could spend a lot more time talking about why it's important to try to support uh, communities and local fishermen and their, their resilience. Um, I, we're not going to focus on that today, but if you presume for the moment that that is important, then you do want to find a way to measure with uh, with credibility what the impacts of your strategy is going to be on, on local communities. Uh, feeding more people, you know, that's that's pretty clear metric around looking at what's the increased um, productivity of a fishery that's managed more sustainably. Um, of course, in some cases, we might be talking about ways to reduce landings um, permanently. And so that might not be an impact that's associated with uh, any given strategy, although in depleted fisheries where there is the potential to improve their 
performance and productivity over time, that can be an important element to consider. Um, and in the equation of uh, and desire for food security globally, there is, I think, a wider range of investors that can get excited about improving food security and feeding more people, whether it be, you know, local uh, people improving food security at a local level or also at a global level. If you, um, some of you on the phone may have taken the time to explore what some of the projected food demand is and protein demand over the next 30 to 50 years, given population growth and economic development globally. And it's, um, you know, it's stark. It's, uh, there will be increasing pressure to provide protein supplies. And so to the extent we can better manage fisheries to serve that end, but manage them sustainably, um, that can be an important uh, return element to consider. And then the financial returns are, are pretty obvious as it's described there, 5 to 25% or more. How are we doing on time, Sarah? We have uh, still 19 minutes. Yeah, keep going. For 19 minutes for the presentation or for the question, including the questions? Well, total. We don't have um, a lot of questions right now. I'm sure they'll come in when we're done, but uh, go ahead and finish. I, it, it's I'm going to try yeah. to go through these case studies pretty quickly and then we can open up to questions. So I've, I've sure, I'm sharing with you two case studies. One is connected to an investment that I'm working on right now with fishermen and um, stakeholders in New England. And this uh, this is the Cape Cod scallop fishery. It's, it's as, uh, as many of you may be aware, a very well-managed, healthy fishery, which has some upside potential in terms of biomass increases and, um, and productivity. It, it, uh, the chart on the right shows you where the biomass has, has uh, developed over time. It was depleted for some period of time. It's been you know, prolific more recently. And the <clears throat> landings, that red line is sort of a proxy for landings in the fishery have, have been stabilized and over the last 10 years with the transition to IFQ management. This is a fishery that already has best-in-class science and rotational management. It's a catch share system, has some upside volume potential and very strong market fundamental scallop is a, is a species on the, that has few substitutes um, to compete with it on price. So <clears throat> what's the investment here? We're talking about up to a $5 million investment to support the New England Scallop IFQ fishery. This strategy would involve partnering with fishing communities to acquire fishing quota for lease to small boat fishermen. What is the impact strategy in this case? Create a community permit bank that organizes and supports fishermen. It cultivates leadership that can advocate for management improvements over time. And the, the impact thesis with this strategy is that if you create strong leadership with a stewardship orientation to the fishery and give them uh, a long-term stake in the fishery through community held quota that you're aligning the financial interests with the long-term health of the fishery and that can be a powerful thing <clears throat> and supports adaptive management over time. The commercial strategy here as I said is buying quota, leasing that quota to generate cash flows, a portion of the cash flow can be used to repay investors and a portion can fund incremental management improvements over time. Um, the structure of the transaction involves creating a special purpose entity with shared equity ownership and uses a combination of grant, equity, and loans to acquire the quota. Um, there's a strong governance structure that's, that's um, been designed that gives uh, a share of control over the decision making to Catch Invest with its mission orientation, the impact investors who also have a mission orientation, and the community as well as a very explicit charter of responsibilities and shared mission. And the financial model for this transaction suggests the ability to generate something like an 8% annual base case return. Um, and from an impact standpoint, the metrics include standing up this permit bank as an as a ongoing institution in the community, supporting the ongoing health of the fishery. If we look at the risks of this investment, we could sort of rate them as low to moderate. There's, there's relatively low biological risk uh, compared to other types of investments in fisheries, low regu regulatory risk given that it's a very well-managed fishery already. The historical landings and ex vessel crisis are strong. There's no real illegal fishing activity that's taking place or very de minimis. Um, the team of folks, you know, um, that are involved in the board are strong and have experience in the fishery. 
The business strategy is straightforward and not very complex. It's really like it's almost like owning a building and renting it out. It's a, it's a straightforward, singular activity. There are some risks <clears throat> around conflicts with qu quota leasing allocations for those that have worked in catch or fisheries. You know what that's about. Um, but all that low to moderate risk also means that you can acquire and invest in this strategy with a combination of loans, even with their fixed payment schedule and equity to really try to optimize the sources of capital that you can bring to bear. And what would the return requirement be for this low to moderate risk? Does our, does our base case projected return fit with the level of risk associated with this investment? I would say that for a low risk investment, the base case return should be in a range of six to eight percent. The worst case shouldn't be less than three to five percent with no loss of principal risk. Um, the best case doesn't need to be higher than 10%. That's a pretty good range for an investor for a lower risk strategy. Um, the impact returns here are focused on protecting the existing biomass, incremental management improvement, and strengthening of the local businesses and community. Let's look at something on the other end of the spectrum, the Chilean hate fishery. This is a severely depleted fishery with a high level of illegal fishing and limited accountability. Um, overfishing has occurred. There's sort of a trophic issue. Uh, with a new predator in the ecosystem, the giant squid. Um, <clears throat> there's a, a, you know, sort of desperate fishermen catching juvenile fish um, in, in large numbers, a high level of illegal fishing activity, and no monitoring or observer coverage of the artisanal fleet, uh, which catches about 50% of the uh, legal amount of fish. Um, and may, probably, you know, up to three times people estimate what they're today permitted to do. So this is an investment, by the way, that was profiled in the investment blueprints um, funded by Bloomberg Philanthropies and supported by Encouraged Capital. I'll, I'll show you where you can find a full write-up on this particular case study. Um, and this is not an investment that's occurred, but one that was proposed, a $17.5 million investment to restore the hate fishery that involves partnering with Chilean fishing coletas, local NGOs, and government to implement a multi-pronged project and strategy. Um, here, we're talking about partnering with initially five fishing cooperatives and ultimately up to 12, installing vessel monitoring systems and catch documentation, upgrading landing facilities, refitting 20% uh, of the vessels to take away effort from the, the hake fishery and focus it on squid, reducing fishing effort by by shelving a, a portion of the quota um, temporarily, 7% uh, of the total fishery uh, landings. And the commercial strategy here does involve buying quota that would have a higher value in the future to help reward investors for taking this risk, but also involves acquiring a packaging, processing, and storage business that would generate profits aligned with increasing volumes over time if the fishery recovers. The structure would involve, similar to the other um, case, creating a special purpose entity with shared ownership, establishing government and a, and a charter of responsibilities. And the governance here would be really critical in terms of ensuring what the government role would be when you think about the stakeholder roles and responsibilities, because in order for the illegal fishing to really be reduced, the government's going to end up having a large role to play. And what's, what are the, what's the risk associated with that? And how can their commitment be assured and their uh, funding for that role be assured as well. The financial model in this case suggests the base case uh, commensurate with the higher risk of a 16% annual base case return and the uh, <clears throat> impact metrics could include biomass, significant biomass restoration, um, increase in fisher incomes and meals to market. If we think about the risks here, much higher risk than the, the earlier case study, high biological risk with a long timeline, high regulatory risk, significant dependence on government enforcement change. Um, historical landings and ex-vessel prices in this fishery are volatile, and whitefish just as a category has many substitutes and so can really have a lot of swings over time that would affect the financial performance of this strategy. Significant illegal fishing activity to curtail a complex, very complex management structure, very complex multi-layer business strategy. So really just a lot higher risk. Um, the base case returns for something with this level of risk should be kind of at least in the 12 to 15 percent range. Worst case probably shouldn't be less than 8 percent and the upside should be, you know, higher than 15 percent going up to 30, 35, 40 
for venture capitalists, you know, that take the highest risk of all, they require 50 to 75 percent returns on their investment. And the reason they have to do that is that the risk of failure is so high. They, they make 10 investments and only one will succeed. That one investment has to cover their loss of capital on the other nine. And that's kind of the philosophy that someone would bring to something like this. That's not to say that with this, you know, if the total cost of all the improvements here were really $17.5 million and that you didn't think you could achieve the rate of return required to attract private investment, maybe there's a role there for grant capital to play a significant uh, part of the equation where, you know, $5 million you kind of raise in grant funding, but you promise those grant makers that you're leveraging their grant capital by tripling, uh, you know, private funding to come in behind it, and that can be a way to approach it. Metrics here, restoring the Hake biomass to 75% of MSY, doubling Fisher incomes, and over 160 more million more meals to market. So if we compare these two opportunities, the scallop strategy, you know, return objectives are fishery protection. The Chilean Hake is fishery restoration, much higher risk. Budget and use of funds, really we're just talking about quota for scallop. Um, we're talking about management improvements, you know, very significant management improvements, quota, and processing operations that all have to be funded with the investment capital. Um, cash flow and impact projections, uh, moderate risk, what's this? Oh, I would say, you know, kind of moderate level of performance where you really need to expect a high performance from the Hake strategy. Regulatory risk low for scallop, high for Hake management and strategy, experience, track record in the case of New England and the Chilean Hake strategy is going to be a totally new venture, bringing together multiple stakeholders. Transaction structure simple for scallop, complex for Hake, historical performance strong for scallop, volatile for Hake. So you're getting the picture, right? Um, the higher risk strategy probably needs to have a higher rate of return for it to work. So some conclusions and highlights um, and recommendations. You know, for those that are interested in trying to develop the business case, try to find an intermediary to help you. Um, I'll touch on some of the groups that might be interested in doing that in a minute. Don't shortcut on creating accurate, robust estimates of expenses and a financial model. Structuring is key to success to align stakeholders, ensure accountability, and reduce risk. Um, consider the risk carefully to understand the worst case and best case scenarios, and, and then, you know, try to find ways to mitigate them in your strategy. And um, be aware that impact investments can include multiple layers of capital and multiple types of funders. So there's no one size fits all, um, that, but that's why it might be help, helpful to find intermediaries to work with. And I guess I'll pause there and see what kind of questions people have. Um, Kelly, why don't you just go ahead to your last slide and we'll use up the remaining time for questions. Um, and also, uh, do you have a few minutes to stay after? I do. To address some questions? Okay. I just wanted to highlight here where you can find additional information. Um, the New England Scallop case study is a sort of live transaction, but you know, feel free to reach out if you want to learn more about quota investing and in, in catch our fisheries. Um, investing for sustainable global fisheries is a 450-page report that that Vibrant Oceans, the Bloomberg Philanthropy's Vibrant Oceans Initiative, and Encourage Capital produced, and it's a very pretty website. If anyone, for anyone who hasn't seen it yet, invest in Vibrant Oceans. Dot org, or you can go to the Encourage Capital website to find that. And there's a very um, sort of well-written six case studies that are extensive and very elaborate and comprehensive that can really give you a crystal clear picture of um, what it means to develop a business case. And not, not that every, every project would need to have something that elaborate, but um, it's, you know, it's written in a more expanded form to help people understand the material there and what you're trying to get at. Those, those investment cases are about 50 pages or more long each, and I would say an investor more likely would be happy to see something in the 25 to 30 page range, but touching on all those issues that you'll see described. And then there are a couple of other case studies you might find interesting if you haven't seen them. The Belize Lobster and Indonesian Blue Swimming Crab case studies published by the ISU, EDF, and Vivid Economics. Then in terms of um, organizations you might reach out to for advice um, on quota strategies, you know, proliferation of groups in the, in the U.S. Um, that have been operating. And um, in terms of this kind of newer incarnation of sustainable fisheries investment funds, uh, our website for Catch Invest will 
be launching in late March, so sorry, I can't direct you there just yet. But the Althelia Sustainable Ocean Fund, the Encourage Capital website, and the Rare Malloy Fund sites are all there. So that's all I've got, Sarah. Awesome. Uh, we, we have some great questions now, so uh, we'll try and get to as many as we can. Uh, so thank you so much, Kelly. This was fascinating. Um, all right, starting in. So I'm interested in whether any projects have looked at aquaculture development as a component of a fisheries impact investment to supplement reduced wild catch. And that's a great question. And um, you know, the, just to highlight a few resources there, some of you may be aware of AquaSpark, which is a sustainable aquaculture fund that's focused exclusively on aquaculture. Um, in terms of combining aquaculture projects into a wild catch fishery strategy, that's something that we looked at with as part of the vibrant oceans approach. It, you know, it's another la layer of complexity. Aquaculture has a very distinct and separate set of risks uh, associated with it, you know, that just sort of add to the complexity but also can offer a more stable, potentially, um, support to a strategy because it's a more controlled, you know, can be a more controlled environment. And um, I would highlight, for example, the Cape Cod Fisheries Trust in New England about a year and a half ago did, in fact, make an investment into a hatchery project um, on Cape Cod. And that hatchery project can gen is helping to generate revenues that support the Cape Cod Fisheries Trust. and their alliance, and also supports fishermen as an alternative source of income. So there's a whole range of, of you know, let's say sub-projects that fall into the category of alternative incomes that could be really interesting to explore, but, but no one, uh, to my knowledge, has, has done that yet tied together with a wild catch strategy, except for, you know, this, this case of the hatchery that I just mentioned um, in New England. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Um, and while we're on this slide, there was a question, a relevant question. Um, somebody said, curious about the intermediaries. Who are they and what, what do they do? Um, the ones listed here? Well, I, I, I think they were referring to the earlier slide when you said find an intermediary, and I thought it was relevant uh, since you have the slide up. Yes, so, um, well, there's a little, <clears throat> you know, these, on this slide here that you can see on your screen now, Sustainable Fisheries Investment Funds and Managers, most of these groups are eager to um, assist in developing investments. It's costly to do that, and so depending on what a funding source might be for something, like if you had a budget and you were trying to develop a business case, I think you could reach out to at least, you know, Catch, Invest, Encourage, and Rare, and Althelia may be willing to do this too, and, and pay them to help you develop a business case. Um, and people, you know, probably have their different ways of charging for that. Um, I think there's likely, there's been a lot of discussion recently about the establishment or launch of so-called project development organizations. And for most fisheries projects, because there's such a high degree of stakeholder engagement that needs to occur and stitching together commitments from multiple stakeholders and the complexity here, that there's an argument that there needs to be a new type of intermediary that exists in other industry sectors let's call it a project developer. So take the case of real estate, you know, an investor doesn't even come to the table until a project developer, a real estate project developer, who has already hired an architect, already negotiated the local, you know, building code and, and excavation requirements, et cetera, puts that all together, comes up with a budget, and then goes to the investor to say, give me the money to build, you know, the hotel. So there's a growing case for the need for project developers, and in fact, Catch Invest has partnered with another organization called um, Blue U Consulting, some of you may know, to, and, and won an innovation grant from the Walton Family Foundation to try to create a business plan for a project developer. It's, right now we're calling it Impact Blue. Um, it probably will end up with a different name, but I would say stay tuned for, for project developers that may be emerging to help uh, provide more robust and more cost-effective kind of intermediary support because I think the challenge right now is as a, if you're set up as an investment fund, which is what most of these groups are trying to do, you know, Althelia, Encourage, I can't speak to as much rare. It's just it's very expensive to develop those case to develop those business cases at the stage of risk where, you know, you might spend six months developing a business case and find out there isn't one. And those you know, an investment focus organization isn't set up to take that kind of risk. They have to worry about putting their money out as soon as possible, and so they're more eager to find something that's, we would say, more bait 
uh, before they get involved or they have to charge a high price to you know to help um, put it together so but I would you could I would encourage you to reach out to folks at any of those places and, and ourselves included if you have an idea of something you want to work on and we can consider if there's a way to be helpful in a cost-effective manner Okay, great, Kelly. Um, I'm going to combine, I'm going to read you two questions which are related. Um, have you looked into incorporated, incorporating marine protected areas into a fishery investment structure? And the other one, as I wonder if there's any example of impact investment where they have combined sustainable fisheries and marine protected area financing or management. So um, my focus is pretty specifically on fisheries and not on the wider range of conservation strategies. That being said, you know, some fisheries management plans either benefit or, or require, in some cases, an MPA to be part of the equation. And to the extent there's a cost associated with establishing that, so let's say there's some, you know, spatial um, assessment that needs to be made or some regulatory change to establish an MPA or, you know, just might call it a no-take zone in some cases, um, then definitely that can absolutely be a part of the equation the, the fisheries management improvements there's there's so much debate I think across the NGO community around what's the right standard and you know how do we make sure this is being driven to the right standard of accountability and management and from the investor standpoint um, you know I want to find the right standard that people feel is appropriate but I'm sort of indifferent to what that means if you're the if you're the fishery expert and you tell me that this fishery needs a no take zone or an MPA to recover then I'm putting it in the budget because I won't get my financial return if that doesn't happen or, you know, or if it's a cost effective way to produce the outcome that we're, you know, as part of our shared mission. Um, so absolutely it can be included, though, again, there haven't been enough, it's not that there's an example of that exactly occurring today because there just haven't been enough data points, you know, yet undertaken, enough investments undertaken um, to really consider those types of strategies yet. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Um, what are the barriers to larger scale investments? Uh, they are relatively small, I think, uh, I'm assuming meaning the examples we saw, uh, compared to what we see in some land-based impact investment. Do you think investors are wanting larger scale investments? Um, perhaps it reflects the relative newness of fishery impact investment. I think that is a part of it. Um, it's also the case that, unfortunately, the seafood industry is very fragmented and there's not a mainstream market benchmark that's easy to compare to, so there aren't so many publicly traded companies that have equity research on them. If you, you know, if you want to be a sustainable timber investor, you can go to the public markets and look at what Plum Creek is doing, and that helps you consider the risk and the valuation that you apply to the sustainable version of an investment that doesn't exist so easily in the fisheries space. Um, the risks of these complex strategies have not been tested yet, and so um, I think that there's more, probably more of an inclination to start small. I, one of the things Impact Blue, this project development um, plan, is trying to consider is, well, all right, you know, we know investors actually like bigger investments because they got to spend a lot of money to figure out the risk, and they'd rather get more bang for the buck by putting a lot more money out at a time. Um, on the other hand, they're not willing to just sign away money day one and kind of then look away while someone goes and spends it. So what if we stitch together, you know, six or eight or ten projects? They might all be small individually, one to three million dollars, but in total you might have a 15 to 20 million dollar portfolio that you kind of, you know, if you develop them simultaneously, then you can offer to investors simultaneously. and. That offers a lot of benefits, scale, diversification of risk across a number of different fisheries, um, and their, you know, their biological performance may vary. So that's a sort of way to approach getting to larger scale faster than waiting for a bunch of small investments to perform and then assuming you can just do bigger singular investments. Um, and that's, that's one of the things we're trying to do. Okay. All right. Thank you, Kelly. Um, have you come across any cases in which impact investing has supported um, Marine Stewardship Council certification or something equivalent? Um, no, I mean, not specifically, but I would say the, you know, the Hake strategy or the Scallop strategy are, in a way, easily incorporate an MSC certification approach. So, I mean, I've, and I've talked to a number of, of fishery participants 
who have considered getting MSc certification and said, you know, show me what it costs to get certification, including show me your stock assessment costs, show me everything. And if it can be afforded in the context of the profit potential, you know, in those return ranges, then yeah, love to fund an MSc certification plan. Certainly, um, you know, a lot of the quota investments that are made are in fisheries that are certified, like the scallop fishery in New England. And in the case of um, the hake fishery in Chile, I would expect that um, it strive for MSC certification over time as it was able to implement management improvements. The, those are kind of two extreme ends of the spectrum, low risk and high risk. In the middle are a bunch of fisheries that, you know, might require less effort and have less risk to achieving certification and the cost of certification and the management interventions required can absolutely be included in these strategies. Okay. All right, thank you, Kelly. And um, okay, no question. It says hi, Kelly. Thanks for the presentation. Um, how do you put into the same scheme the capital returns and the impacts? These are measured with different scales, and in reality, they sometimes go in different directions. So let's talk about measurement first, and then talk about the different directions. I think I understand what that part of the question means. But um, so uh, you know, measuring different scales. It, uh, in, I invite the um, the questioner to tell you, Sarah, what like come up with your two examples of an impact that you want to measure. I'm going to sort of address two as examples, but I want to make sure that I'm thinking the way that you, the same way that you are. Let's say that one of our impact metrics is increasing the biomass in a fishery. Um, you know, our management interventions. Uh, we we would probably look to a biomodeling team like UCSB or, um, you know, other scientists that work in the fishery to tell us what's the likelihood, uh, what's the range of possible outcomes on biomass recovery given these management interventions that we're proposing to undertake. And that's an important part of that kind of impact strategy that would need to be um, developed um, as part of the business case. And those outputs, you know, are going to exist on their own timeline, but also link to and drive the financial performance. So I don't necessarily see them as being separate. Um, you know, if the biomass is increasing over time and we have the stock assessments to show that and we incorporate the right buffers and so forth, management contingencies, and we can see then that landings will likely increase over time against that biomass, um, that in turn fuels, you know, whatever the likely uh, performance of the quota or the, you know, the supply chain business, et cetera, are going to experience. Um, in terms of where they can go sideways, you know, in some fisheries, uh, to pick on the same metric, if, uh, let's say, overfishing is occurring, um, but there's not really an expectation that biomass can increase much, it's just that you need to reduce effort in order to maintain what you already have. Those, in some ways, are maybe the hardest cases to use impact investment for because um, unless you find another way to generate significant return to pay, let's say it's a, you know, it's very expensive to reduce the fishing effort. You have to buy out a bunch of vessels or something. That's your, that's your strategy is you want to reduce the fleet size and reduce the effort and, you know, maybe you're transitioning it to some limited access or, or um, catch limit uh, regulatory framework as well, but part of it is very expensive vessel buyout to reduce the fleet size. And that fishery doesn't have a big potential to recover. You know, the question becomes, well, how do I get my money back if I'm an investor? That might be a case where it's actually not, it's not possible. And I, I wouldn't say that impact investment is appropriate for every kind of strategy that needs to be undertaken. Um, my hope is that if we can peel off the kinds of strategies that can afford a repayment scheme, you know, schedule, that that reduces the philanthropic burden to solve for problems in those fisheries and allows it to laser focus on fisheries like the one I just described um, that really have no other op option but to either convince the government and fishermen just take the loss or, um, you know, can bring some philanthropic capital to bear to help subsidize that transition. Okay, thanks, Kelly. And, and Rodrigo had followed up uh, with, he said, for example, with the hake, sometimes better livelihoods for fishermen don't go hand in hand with higher prices on the quota in the midterm, at least, which is the time frame fishers work in. Ah, well, that's a great question. Um, and uh, is that Rodrigo from MSC in Chile? Hi, Rodrigo, if that's the case. 
or Rodrigo from EDF. I might be mixing up my Rodrigos. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the so one important thing and we haven't talked about it very much here that I think is really essential to aligning the interests of stakeholders in these strategies is to make sure that fishermen are participants in the investment. That doesn't mean they have to put money up, but that they should receive a share of ownership of whatever the profit-making entity is here. So for example, with the Hake fishery, fishermen should just be given a share of ownership, in my view, into that business model so that in addition to potentially, you know, if there's volume increases and they can sell more fish or sell, sell bigger fish at better prices, et cetera, and that can be part of the equation for them, there's also a share of ownership in however the investors profiting the fishermen should profit. Their interests should be aligned. And, uh, I mean, philosophically, I'm also of the belief that, that uh, fishermen take the most risk. They're being asked to make the most sacrifice, and therefore they should receive the reward. Um, and that's a way to tie them to the longer-term reward that can be generated from more sustainable management. So these quota permit banks are a great way to do that because fishermen do benefit very directly from the holdings of the quota. They're not just paying, let's say, a higher lease price as the quota gets more valuable, but they own the quota. So they're, they benefit from the higher lease price to others. They, um, they can sell that quota at higher prices in the future if they want to. Um, and they might, maybe they even get a dividend from it, you know, if you structure it in that way, uh, from whatever the performance of it is. So if at a minimum it can make a wash some of the higher costs they experience, or it might actually generate and contribute to their overall income level over time. Okay. All right. Thank you, Kelly. Um, let's just do one or two more, and then uh, we'll, we'll uh, have to. There, we won't be able to get to quite all of them, and I apologize for that. Um, do you, well, let's, one last one. Uh, do you think that there is greater investor appetite for re recovering depleted fisheries or protecting healthy but unmanaged fisheries? Um, that's a complex question. I think there is enormous appetite for recovering depleted fisheries. That's what gets impact investors excited. <clears throat> Unfortunately, when it comes to cutting the check, we've not yet seen people sign up for recovering depleted fisheries. Um, they've been more risk averse than that. And that's, I mean, that's just a phenomenon in trying to engage with investors in a new space. They, you know, there's a great interest, but there's also risk aversion. Um, so I would say today, and uh, I mean, this different organizations have taken a different view about this. Some, you know, some of the organizations listed on this page here are working hard to raise money to support higher risk strategies. And I think that's great. I hope they are successful to do that. Um, I think that it's more likely to be the case if we look at the overall kind of marketplace of these things that we'll see a slow build of investments into lower risk strategies to start and hopefully over a three to five year time frame a willingness to undertake higher risk strategies, higher, you know, um, and to the, hope, I'd like to think there are ways that we can try to bridge investor interest and appetite. This impact blue thing that we're working on is trying to create a way to engage investors so they get, you know, earlier in the process so that they get more comfortable with the risk. They understand how the fishing sector works and what volatility in the sector looks like over time so that when it comes time to asking for the actual check, you know, they are well versed and understand and, and, and some of their concerns may have been addressed through some of the structural decisions I touched on. You know, if you understand where the investor is concerned earlier on, you can design the strategy to help mitigate their concerns and risk and the risk level. Um, so I'd, I'd like to think project developers can help to accelerate the flow of capital into the higher risk strategies, but, um, you know, that, that remains to be seen. Okay, one, one last question. Uh, okay, can you please elaborate on how holding on quotas until stock recovers would give investors any profit? Do you mean they are buying hypothetical future quotas? So, you know, this would vary in each type of fishery and the type of quota system it is, but just to pick one that I know very well, if you buy a quota, for example, in the New England ground fish fishery today, it's, uh, that's, the ground fish fishery has a lot of trouble. It's, you know, there's been a lot of illegal fishing activity from certain participants. There's not enough monitor, monitoring and observer coverage on the vessels. Um, the stock assessments are infrequent. And so it's in trouble. 
um, in spite of the fact that it is a cat share fishery. <clears throat> it has many other management deficiencies. So today you could buy quota in the ground fish fishery, you know, let's say you, you've spent $5 million for that quota, which um, doesn't allow you to catch many fish because the, the, the total allowable catches, the tax in that fishery have been so dramatically reduced, you know, 50% a year, 170% the next year, 20% the year after, just down, 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 down. Um, 10 years from now, if you implement the right management, reforms, you could see that fishery, you know, quintuple in size. I mean, it's, it generates, I'm not going to do it, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but um, let's say today it's generating, you know, $50 million in revenues. It could be generating $200 million in revenues. So the quota value in that fishery, if you bought it today and then you went to sell it 10 years from now, you could also quintuple in size. Um, I mean, in value, could, could, could quintuple in value. Now, in terms of how an investor structures an investment in a way that provides support after that 10th year to the fishery and is sort of still aligned with conservation um, a mission and so forth is a more complex question. You know, do you, who, who are you going to sell it to? Do you want to sell it back to a community? Do you want to continue to hold on to it and just take some dividends each year from it? That's going to depend a lot on what kind of investor supports it and what, you know, how you, maybe you can agree to sell it to a community organization at a discount to market value. And so that's still delivering benefit to the community, um, but, you, you know, you've made a significant return, so you're happy with that. There, there, there would be lots of bells and whistles to think about, but fundamentally speaking, the value of that quota, you know, in a depleted to healthy fishery is going to dramatically increase. Okay. Kelly, thank you so much. This was amazing. We, there were still a few questions uh, we weren't able to get to, but uh, I think we've got to call I, it I'm now. Happy, I'm happy to keep going. If I mean, people <laughs> off, but, uh, I don't mind taking a few more. Okay. Uh, well, one I accidentally deleted, but all right. Uh, here's another one in that case. Uh, and I'm so sorry. For, uh, I can don't think I can recover it yet, but um, I will be able to send it to Kelly afterwards because it'll be in the uh, official records. Um, the one, one, another one is, given that many fisheries rely on an open access source, is the regulatory risk too high for many fisheries to allow for a strong case to be made for impact investing? Talking about open access management systems? Um, I think maybe that the fisheries are, uh, that fish, uh, my assumption reading it was that fisheries are open access. Which yes, I think, you know, like if you thought of the spectrum of management being on the one end 100% open access and in the middle, let's say, output controls and on the far end um, uh, rights-based management systems, and not everyone would agree with that spectrum, I'm sure. Um, and not to say that rights-based management systems are the end-all, be-all, because they don't work for every fishery or, you know, some fisheries they just won't work for. But if you just tried to imagine the spectrum where open access is clearly on the far left side, um, that I would say in most cases, unless it's just a healthy fishery today, is probably not a fishery that an investor would want to take a risk on. Because, um, you know, let's say it's a depleted fishery, open access. You make a bunch of management improvements, but the bigger the fishery gets, the more fishing effort it's applied. And you don't ever, you know, you, you take it right back down to where you started. So there's that, in that case, that quota value is not going to increase. That throughput in the processing facility is not going to increase. The, the impacts of all your effort and management improvements are totally diluted by additional effort that is applied to the fishery. So... Um, almost by definition, if something's an open access fishery today, the management improvements ought to take into account ways to limit access, limit catch, maybe introduce rights-based management, et cetera, and recognizing those are, you know, fra politically fraught um, conversations, the sort of, the further along something is from open access, then, you know, maybe the higher probability of success in the context of an investment. Um, part of the Impact Blue scoping strategy for this project development platform is, in fact, to try to define what are the minimum enabling conditions that likely make it possible in a reasonable time frame to use impact investment to solve, you know, to, to fund management improvements. And my guess is there probably aren't many examples of something that's 100% open access um, if it's a politically difficult environment that where it would make sense because you probably just need five years, you know, or four years to 
negotiate and pressure and advocate the for the government to make a change um, uh, to, to limit access. So the okay. time is too long. Okay. okay, sorry, go ahead and finish. No, that's it. I was just saying the okay. time frame is too long and there's too much uncertainty with it for an investor to use return-seeking capital support. It's more, that's, a, you know, falls in the category of maybe more suited for philanthropic or grant <coughs> capital to support those very, very early days of advocacy and change. Okay, Kelly, thank you so much. This was fantastic, and uh, lots of people sent in their thanks uh, for a great presentation, and, and just um, so glad we were able to have you on. We had tons of people who were able to stay the full time to listen to all the uh, answers to the questions, which is awesome. Thank you, everyone, for for um, staying with us and and for coming uh, to the webinar today. And Kelly, thank you so much for for being willing to do this. Uh, well, thank you to everyone there. It's really you know I I only um, regret not being able to see who you all are and and have the chance to meet you, but it, I'm. Really excited about our shared mission to try to improve fisheries and find new and innovative ways to do it. So I hope we have the chance to work together sometime in the future. Okay, indeed. Um, and I hope everyone has a good rest of their day and uh, good luck with your work. Okay, bye everyone.